Good morning to you all. It's really great to be here with you at Convocation. And it was great to meet you all on Sunday at the Open House. At least it was great to begin with, because deputies would come up and I'd ask them, you know, maybe I had known them for, for many years, and I'd say, how are things going? And they, you know, a, typic, a typical answer would be something like, things are tough, but they're good, because <laughs> Because in my meditations, I always remember to put things at Master's feet and when I go to work, and they would talk like this, and I would think, huh, that's the fourth question and the fourth answer for the satsang today. And then another devotee would come up, and I'd ask them how they were doing, and they would tell me, and again, they had some little thing that they were doing to bring Master into their lives. And I thought, hmm, well, that's the eighth question. And, uh, and the eighth answer, and it kept on going like this. And by five o'clock, pretty much every question had been answered. <laughs> it got to the point where people would come up, and as they started to pronoun, I'd say, I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> but but not, not every question was answered. There were, so I thought, you know, maybe we should still have the satsang. Um, <laughs> There were a couple of points I wanted to bring up today, like about relaxation and something to do with the ego and how as we relax, you know, worries and fears can drop off. And of course, if you were here last night, you know Brother Satyananda covered those points. <laughs> but, but I was exhilarated. I, I really was exhilarated. The, the thought that all these devotees of Master around the world putting these teachings into practice like that. It was really, it was just a joyous feeling. And, you know, I could have been, I could have been demoralized, but no. <laughs> you know, like feeling like a fifth wheel or something like that. But let's go through the motions anyway, because, you know, we'll see, no matter how many things life throws at us, it comes down to just a few simple things that we can do, that we can all do no matter what our problems are. And at one point, Master actually boils it down to two things, and we'll talk about what those two things are. So the first question. I very much love to pick out various phrases used by Master, and in religion itself, and to the best of my ability, try to make them my own. One such phrase is, possess me and make me feel, in and around me, thine immortal presence. Can you elaborate the meaning of this possession? Well, I wanted to address this question first because I love this idea of making Master's teachings our own. The idea that we can do more than know these teachings, but we can really know them. I can't help but remember a time I was working at the publication center and I was coming up for lunch with one of the other monks. And as we parked the car and he was opening the door, he turned to me and he said, you know, I'm 15 years in the ashram today. And he was very happy about that. And for some reason, I thought, you know, I would play a little joke on him, and I said, 15 years, huh? And what have you learned in that time? <laughs> you know, and I, I braced for the response, well, what have you learned? You know, I had been in the ashram just a year or two more than him. But instead of reacting, he, he stopped. And he was very quiet for a few seconds. And then he thought, that's quite a question. That's quite a question. And I've never forgotten that. And it, I ask myself that question as the years go by. What have I learned? What have I learned? Because we can, we can really know these teachings and we can really practice them. And it's a motivating thought. It's not always an easy thing to do, though. Master himself said that when we read his teachings, what we have to do is resurrect the inmost substance of words from the sepulchre of hollow intellectual concepts. So it's like raising the dead, right? No problem. <laughs> no problem. But we can do that. So to the, to the particular statement of this question, possess me and make me feel thine immortal presence, what does it mean? Well, I think it can only mean one thing, right? That we want God to come in and inhabit our lives in every, in every way possible. 
But the more interesting thing, I think, is how do we react to this idea, to this statement? I can imagine that there may be a feeling of anxiety, you know, well, I like the idea of God coming into my life and feeling God's bliss, but, you know, will I still be able to, you know, insert bad habit here, you know, <laughs> whatever that is, you know, so maybe we're a bit uneasy, but it's natural because we're all starting our spiritual journey from the state of ego consciousness and the ego likes its independence. Thank you very much. It has no desire to be possessed by anything, <laughs> let alone by God. I, I remember some time ago, the thought came into my mind one Saturday morning. I'm not making the progress I think I should be making. I know I have to be patient, but I've, I've been patient long enough. And, <laughs> and, and, and there's something else going on here. And, and I didn't know what it was. Then the question just kind of came into my mind. What would it mean if God came to me right now? And even though my mind responded, yes, there was a little hesitation. And I was really shocked by that little hesitation. I wasn't prepared for the question. It just somehow like it was there. And, I, and it caught me by surprise. And I tried for weeks to figure out, you know, what was that hesitation? The conclusion I came up with, which is obvious in retrospect, is that the ego was concerned about God showing up and saying, things need to change around here. <laughs> but, you know, there are two things if we find ourselves in this situation and we're worried about being possessed by God. We always have control over the extent to which we allow God to come into our lives. The Master was very clear about this. He said, those that don't want God, God can't have. And second, to be possessed by God is really only to be possessed by ourselves, you know, with this capital S, self. Just a minute ago I said that we all start our spiritual journey from a state of ego consciousness, but it's not true. We're starting our return journey to God from a state of ego consciousness. We originally came from God. And at that time, we were part of Him, and all we're doing is going back to Him. As we go back to Him, we, we realize for ourselves why Master said in his poem, Samadhi, Eternity and I, one united ray, a tiny bubble of laughter, I am become the sea of mirth itself. But there's another reaction, you know, that's entirely possible when we hear this idea about being possessed. The first reaction springs from our desire for independence. And the second reaction has to do with an even more powerful yearning. And that's the desire to feel that we belong to something greater than ourselves. Something that we willingly surrender to because we have absolute trust in it. And because it's just the best thing in the world and we want to be part of that. You know, we're, we're a paradox, aren't we humans? We, we yearn to be independent and we yearn to belong. Let's talk a little bit about this idea of belonging. This is the attractive power of God that is calling us home. It starts on the human level, though. And, you know, I was talking with Brother Paramananda this week about convocation. And he mentioned that, you know, we were talking about it, and I thought, I used to think that people came to convocation because, to learn things, to learn Master's teachings, to practice them. But really, it's more than that. We come because... We belong. We come because we belong here. And it's easier to see that desire in other people than it is in ourselves. But if we can acknowledge to ourselves that we have this desire and don't cover it up with other things, it can really open us up to transformation. Because it's a humbling thought to think that we, we, we yearn to belong. And when we're in that state of humility, as we all know, this is when real change can happen. I have a cousin whose husband is in the Marines, and she actually, the U.S. Marines, of course, and uh, when I was going to Hidden Valley to become a monk, she it was that drove me there. I actually stayed in her house uh, for a week on the Marine base at Camp Pendleton before I came into the ashram. And um, then I became a monk, and I didn't see her again for 20 years. 
she had uh, just one child when I la had last seen her, and now her kids were in college. They, she and her family came to Encinitas one day, and we were able to go out for lunch. And uh, I, I had known her husband, of course, really fine man. And as we were going to the restaurant, we could see that, you know, it, it was packed. There were, there were no parking places. We had to park a long way away. And as we got out of the car, my cousin said to her husband, who's a colonel, you know, he commands at least a thousand men, uh, Dear, your mission is to go find us a table. <laughs> and I was... I was kind of surprised at that, and you know, he, he was about to run off, and then he kind of sensed my surprise, and he, he, turned, he stopped, and he looked at his wife, and they both started laughing, and he said, you know, my wife understands that the way to get me to do something is to say it's a mission. <laughs> it's like, dear, your mission is to take out the trash. And, <laughs> and you know, because the Marines have this esprit de corps, and this is what our the first permanent house brother for the monks tried to inculcate in us this... He used the term the esprit de corps. And, you know, this is what we tap into when we come to convocation, the sense of belonging. As Sister Satyavati said in, the, uh, in Glimpses of a Life Div Divine, that was her first thought when she, when she saw Master. Her soul was inwardly singing, at last I have come home, at last I have come home. How amazing is this? Shri Teshwar and Master, they didn't talk about us as students or disciples. To them, we were brother, brothers and sisters, so we belong. Next question. You may think this question is silly and immature, but the idea of eternity creates uneasy feelings in me. I guess fear of the unknown is understandable, but whenever I delve into those thoughts, I feel a little helpless and that the spiritual path is too overwhelming. I think these feelings get in the way of my desire to unite with God and Guru and holds me back in going deeper in my meditation practice. Well, this question is not silly and immature. The same, because the same sense of trepidation we might feel at the thought of being possessed by God can also be there when we consider the notion of eternity. The first time I visited India was in 1992. It was actually our guru's centennial there that year, because in India you're a year old when you're born. And um, one day that, that similar feeling came over me, this sort of uneasiness at the thought of eternity. And I talked to Swami Bhavananda about it, and he said, well, think of it like this. Up to this point in your life, it's like you're living in this big, beautiful garden, landscape garden, but you're actually living in the tool shed at the, at, at the bottom of the garden. And, uh, and you've never left it. And, and one day you think, you know, I'm just going to walk around the garden. And you walk all around the garden and you're like, why did I, why did I stay in the tool shed? And, and then it's like you think, well, I'm going to go into the house. It's this big mansion because they were landscape grounds. And you think, oh, I'm just going to go into the house here. And you go into the house, and, uh, and that's wonderful. And you're like, why was I in the tool shed all those years? And, and then you realize the house is owned by your father, and you are going to inherit the house. And so again, the thought is, well, why did I do that all those years? And, you know, Master tells a number of stories just like that. You know, like the, the prince lost in the suburbs thinking he was a pauper. And Swami Bhavananda said, eternity is yours. Why would you be afraid of it? And those words were very comforting to me, and I've always remembered them. This fear in us is really, again, it's coming from that ego consciousness, and realizing it's there is a good thing. But the Bhagavad Gita is all about facing this fear and conquering it. So it's an important step to recognize that it's there. And it's one reason why the Gita has fearlessness as the first of the 26 qualities of the self-realized sage. The most potent weapon, as we know, in this fight against fear, against the ego consciousness, is meditation. But it has to be meditation with the right understanding. We're children of God. We meditate from that perspective, not that God is out there. 
And this mindset prepares us for the feelings of expansion that can come in a deep meditation. You know, how can we fear something that we are already? It's the ego that makes us think we're separate from eternity. And this is where affirmations can be a great help. Learning to make statements of truth our own. So now I'll tell you what Master said was one of the greatest messages he ever gave for the overcoming of all misery. And this quote applies to many of the questions today. He said, I don't want you to ever forget it. Material remedies, medicines, physical comforts, human consolation, have their place in helping to remove pain. But the greatest remedy is the practice of Kriya Yoga and the affirmation that you are one with God. This is the cure-all for every trouble, pain, and bereavement, the way to freedom from all individual and mass karma. I like to think of this as an existential fear. I don't know if the term is appropriate, but it sounds dramatic. Um, but it can cover up. Uh, it, it's not usually on the surface. We've usually covered it up with other things. But we have to, to look for it, to see that it's there. And again, one of the very first things that Sri Yukteswar told our guru was, this is the first evening, right? You'd think they'd maybe relax a little bit the first evening and just kind of catch up and, you know, maybe get into the training the next day. But Sri Yukteswar, it was his very first um, lesson for our guru. Look fear in the face and it will cease to trouble you. I was so surprised when I read that in the autobiography. I was like, is it that important to, to really cover that right at the beginning? Yeah, it was. And of course, it wasn't for our guru, it was for us. So it's not, again, not a silly and immature question. It's a, it's a real realization about what we're trying to do on the spiritual path. Next question. Master said we should live the life of balanced recklessness. Could you explain what this means and how I can make it part of my life? It sounds exciting, like we should just go for it. <laughs> um, it's, it's just, I mean, these questions, I didn't write them. I mean, but so many of them have to do with fear, don't they, and courage. It's, uh, you know, it's what we need in this life. The quote here, there's this balance recklessness. Master is saying, smile that perpetual smile that smile of God, smile that strong smile of balanced recklessness, that million-dollar smile that no one can take from you. Well, again, I, you know, I think it's fairly straightforward what, what Master is talking about here. It's that we face the challenges of life that our own karma has created, but with God. We bring God into everything. And we have confidence that we can get through to the other side, no matter what the challenge, because God is with us. We can afford to be reckless if we're reckless with God. Now, don't, don't get the wrong idea there. I mean, it's still balanced recklessness. But we do it with God. And, you know, Swami Ram Tirtha's song perfectly captures this, uh, this notion. Friends and counselors, pray waste not your breath. I kind of like that line for some reason. Um, <laughs> Beware, O ye mountains, stand not in my way. Your, your ribs will be shattered and tattered today. You know, Swami Ram Tirtha, he had no fear. I remember talking about this concept at a, at a temple service once, balanced recklessness. I told the story of, this is before I had come into the ashram, and I was faced with a difficult task at work. And I was asked if I wanted to do it. And it had, it had a lot of risks, but it had a lot of upside. And I thought, I really, I, I think I need to do this. But I didn't know for sure, and I thought, I asked my boss, I said, my supervisor, I said, you know, can I have five minutes, and then I'll let you know. And so I had uh, gone to a restroom, it was the only quiet place in the building, you know, an open plan office, and I was asking Master, what should I do? And my mind was so restless, though, that I, I just, I couldn't get a clear answer. But I said to myself something along the lines of, well, you know, balanced recklessness, yeah. Babaji will help. So I went back to my supervisor and I said, I will do it. And uh, he was actually on the phone booking the plane tickets as I was coming into his office. 
And I, I said, well, I, you know, I hadn't given you my answer. And he said, well, I knew you'd say yes. Um, and it worked out great. And I told that story at the temple once, and one of the devotees came up afterwards and said, I had a similar situation once, and uh, it, there was a risk, and I took it, and I've regretted it ever since. <laughs> But, I mean, that's the thing about risk, right? I mean, it's, it's like, it's, it's risky. But um, that was free. Um, but when we do it with Master, you know, and it's like, we have to tune in. We, we do our best. Master, should I do this or not? And then even if we're not quite sure, we make our best decision and we do it with Master. And there's, there's always a spiritual upside and a spiritual lesson to be learned, no matter what happens, no matter what happens. You know, we can't always make perfect decisions in this world. You know, Master said, we wouldn't be here if that was the case. So we have to expect to get it wrong sometimes on that lower, lower physical level in terms of what we do. But it's okay, we just bring Master with us every time. We can always do that. I was, uh, I like to go hiking in the mountains north of here, and um, one day we were crossing, myself and this other monk, we were crossing a narrow saddle, and it was not reckless, it was, it was, it really was pretty safe, but I thought, well, you know, if I fall off here, it won't be the mountain's ribs that are shattered, but, you know, <laughs> that's, that's okay, um, Danger and I were born together, and I... And I thought, well, well, pay attention, because I don't want this monk to have to go back to the ashram and say, you know, his last words were, danger and I were born together. <laughs> and I am more dangerous than da. <laughs> so, balanced recklessness, okay? So, next question. I have been out of work for an extended period of time, and there is a possibility we could lose our home, or at least be saddled with payments that cannot be made. I feel devastated that I am letting my family down. Would you share Yogananda's thoughts for helping to overcome or lessen anxiety? Well, the first thing I would suggest, any time we feel we're at the mercy of circumstances beyond our control, ask for prayers, you know, which you can do on our website and other places, at our temples, centers. And what I found is doing so will at least alleviate the immediate crushing anxiety that we can feel at these times. And it can break the paralysis that anxiety can create. And so it frees us up so that we can continue to make productive efforts to resolve our situations. And then be, and then be ready to take advantage of the opportunities that will come to us as people are praying for us. This was the case for me a few years ago when a family member called and said they had been diagnosed with a, an advanced late-stage illness. And all I could do was really to pray for them and put it in God's hands, which I did immediately. But I, I didn't pray for healing as such. I somehow knew that that wouldn't help my family member and would actually cripple my own prayers with a desire for a particular outcome. And I had to trick myself. I said, well, you know, God, you know the outcome I'd really like, so I'm not even going to ask you for that. Instead, let me pray that this family member always feels supported by you through this experience. And praying that way released the anxiety that I was feeling. And I just continued to pray that way throughout the year or more that the situation lasted. And after it was all over, I felt not closer, not just closer to this family member, but also closer to God. So find a prayer that will allow you, whatever your situation, to feel close to God in your particular situation. And it'll have to come from deep within you. But trust that you can leave the outcome in God's hands and then keep busy with God, looking for ways out of your situation. Bring Him into it. Anxiety is so easy to come by in this world, and some would say that it's 
necessary or we wouldn't even survive, but it can get out of hand very quickly. So this is why Master talks a lot about it. And many of the things that Master advised when we find ourselves in this situation can be found in the little book, Living Fearlessly, which is a, has as much to do with anxiety as it has to do with, with fear. And I found that even if we're feeling a little anxious for, for whatever reason, just picking up that book and reading Master's words, we, we immediately feel courage coming into our, into our mind and even into our body. And, and that little book has physical, mental, emotional, behavioral and spiritual tips and tools that will help us deal with our situation. So if anxiety is natural, it also means that the ultimate solution to anxiety can't be found in this world. And we, we, we all know this. It has to be found in the spiritual realm. And yet, even, even simple physical exercise can do, a, a, can do a great amount in helping us deal with anxiety. And again, I, I, I go back to a little experience I had 20 years ago, again, before I came into the ashram. I was, I was getting really quite worked up over a situation at work, and I, I was managing to keep the anxiety at bay, but it was going on for a week or two or more. I was just new to the path. And one night, one evening, going home from work on the tube, on the, on the underground, on the subway, I could feel this anxiety was starting to build up. You know, this, they call it catastrophizing. Again, risks were real, but, but small. But I was, my mind was dwelling on them. By the time I got back to my apartment, I was, I was in quite a state. And I thought, I don't think I'm going to be able to meditate in this state, and I'm just going to go for a run. And I went out for 20 minutes, ran for 20 minutes and came back, and I, I just felt great. I mean, nothing had changed at work, but I had just gotten it out of the system, gotten it out of the body. And this is why Master has such a balanced path. We don't deal with our spiritual issues or our mental issues or our, our, our physical issues or behavioral or emotional by just tackling them directly. We approach everything that goes on in our lives holistically. That happened 20 years ago, and you know, I've, I never forgot that. And it was like amazing to me, because the problem at work was still there, but I just did not have any worry about it anymore. Master's tensing and relaxing exercises are again a wonderful way to help us deal with anxiety, but Brother Satyananda covered that last evening. <laughs> and, and each of us is different, you know, experiment. Some things work better for us than for others. But at all times, pray and bring Master into it. I recent, next question. I recently had a severe accident with major health consequences. It is frustrating that I'm not functioning anymore as I used to, and I'm unable to keep up my spiritual routine of many years. I have a very hard time battling deep feelings of inadequacy, hopelessness, and discouragement. There is a horrible battle going on within me. What can I do to find peace in my situation? I want to feel close again to Master. Many of us go through things like this, but this is very, very severe accident, it sounds like. The first thing to note here is that the accident is recent, and you will feel close again to Master before long. This this is like a law. Because when we have massive challenges in our lives, it's natural to feel this way, to have these feelings of inadequacy and hopelessness. But you know, we're so resilient. I mean, not just devotees, but people in general. I actually once read that there's something called a happiness set point. And it's kind of this idea that no matter what happens to us, within a year, we're about the same level of happiness that we were before an event happens, whether it's winning the lottery or losing a limb. I should have checked before I came out whether that study was retracted or not. <laughs> but but that's, that's what I read, a happiness set point. 
And so as time goes by, no, no matter what's happened, we regain our equilibrium. But for us as yogis, we're moving, we're hoping to move the happiness set point higher as the years go by. And setbacks such as major physical challenges can be, can be particularly frustrating to us because we're, we're greedy for joy and peace and bliss. And when these major things happen and they affect our routine, it's, you know, it can be very frustrating. But again, we find peace as we learn to accept what has happened. But sometimes we need, again, these affirmations to help us quickly move, that, move through that initial period where we're frustrated and discouraged. And here again, it's the same point that we talked about in the last question. Even though it's often not of immediate uh, comfort to us when something has happened, but Master says, Difficult experiences are a necessary part of spiritual growth. He says, in fact, difficulties come to us in order to, make, to awaken us to the realization that this life is a dream. This lesson, again, this lesson we all have to learn. And it's a tough one. I remember talking to a devotee who had long-standing, progressively deteriorating physical condition which in all likelihood was only going to get worse. And we were just talking in general terms about the path. When out of the blue he mentioned his condition, I didn't bring it up, and he said, you know, I wouldn't wish my situation on my worst enemy, but it's made me what I am. And there was such a, a strength and goodness flowing from him that I, I felt like bowing at his feet. It was this feeling like of just wanting to bow at his feet. These things, they can transform us in, in ways that nothing else can. Another thing that's helpful to realize when we're going through situations like this is that the feeling of closeness to Master will come back, but it's not crucial to feel that closeness at all times, even though we want to. The feeling can actually, or could actually, become a, a kind of a crutch that can limit our spiritual growth. And when we're going through a situation such as described in this question, Sister Gyanamata's writings can offer much solace to us. They're tough, but they can offer solace. And she said to a devotee, you said while we were talking that you no longer had any feeling. I think you will remember this, even if I'm not putting it exactly right. We make too much of feeling, even admitting that the right kind of feeling is very enjoyable. What does it matter how you feel? Bear your lot as long as it is the will of God that you should do so. Act rightly, and in due time, the right feeling of peace and joy will come. And when it does come, we will know that we have been transformed. Next question. As a parent, I often feel overwhelmed with work at work, work at home, and activities of my children after school, creating a social circle for them, sometimes taking on the problems of my friends, and then providing three nutritious meals each day for my family. As a result, these various demands result in negative feelings, sensitivity, and mental fatigue. As a sincere devotee who loves Master and her family, can you help me do a little better with these challenges? Well, one thing is clear, and of course I don't have these particular challenges, but but it's clear from the description here, and it's also clear for many devotees living li a life where there's so much going on. We're already doing the best we can. And if that's the case, doing better is going to have to mean doing a little bit less, so that we have enough time for ourselves and our relationship with God. I mean, in this particular question, the devotee says she's taking on the problems of her friends. And maybe this just means we're praying for them, we're, we're helping them out where we can. And that's good. That, obviously, that's great. But, but we really can't take on their problems. That's their karma, and they're going to have to work that out. Now, by saying that, of course, you can perhaps understand why my youngest brother, who's a helper personality type too, 
what he really meant when he said that he thought it was a good thing for the world that I had joined the ashram. <laughs> But when we have figured out what we can let go of, then we can spend some of that time that we have freed up getting back in touch with this real purpose that we were doing all these things for in the first place. You know, again, it's like, what is our mission? What is really ours to do? And then the negative feelings and the mental fatigue can begin to dissipate. These feelings are a warning that we, as, as, you under, as, as we know from this question, that something has to change here. And even as we do our best for our families, again, just like when we have an illness and it's, it's out of our control, we, we do our best to put it in Master's hands. And I know it's easy for me to say, but I think Master would say it. You know, after all, who do we trust more? God or ourselves? There's a Gita verse that I think, I like to think of it a lot. When I first read it, when I first read the Gita, I didn't realize just how, how uh, useful it was as, as, a, as a way to live our lives. And Krishna tells Arjuna, our own duty Though deficient in quality, is superior to duty other than one's own, even though that be well accomplished. Better it is to die in svadharma, meaning our duty, what is our mission. Paradharma, which is not our mission, is fraught with fear and danger. So even in, a, in family life or whatever relationships we have, there's an appropriate amount that we do even for our nearest and dearest. But, but even our nearest and dearest belong to God, and we, we put it in God's hands. Maybe it's someone else's mission to take out the trash. <laughs> Next question. Could you please discuss detachment on the spiritual path? I know it pertains to governing our likes and dislikes, desires, wishes, etc., but I find myself getting lost in how to actually overcome or resist them. I have enough struggles just trying to overcome drinking too much coffee and eating desserts. <laughs> how can I cut to the chase and make some good inroads? One of our devotees once told Brother Paramananda, I was going through a really difficult time, Brother. Getting nowhere, it seemed, nothing was working for me. A change was not happening. And then I read The Law of Success. Brother, that book changed my life. It changed my life. So, maybe that's a good place to start. Read The Law of Success. Study it and make what you read there, make it your own. You know, much research has been done over the years about what goes into uh, making a successful life for ourselves. And as far as I can tell, you know, what we found out so far on that level, these things are all covered in the law of success. Simple things, it, it can seem, but we try them and we realize they're powerful. For example, start small and don't move on until you've achieved some success. Then choose something bigger to test yourself on. I mean, it sounds so simple, right? But in this little book, Master goes beyond these psychological keys or tricks. And he brings in the spiritual aspects as well. And again we, we, again, we come back to the same thing we've talked about so often today. Do it with God. Bring God into it. Now, depending on who we are and where we're at, there's another approach to change that we can take. And one of my favorite quotes from Master is this. Love is one of the greatest stimulants to the will. Under the influence of love, the will can do Almost anything. I had to glance down because I was going to say can do anything, but it's, Master says, the, under the influence of love, the will can do almost anything. So maybe reading whispers from eternity for you, along with the law of success perhaps, will give you the best chance of making those inroads that you yearn for. There's a talk in, in Man's Eternal Quest, and it's called Curing Mental Alcoholics. And that also has some wonderful pointers to help us get out of a rut. One of the best things we can do if we're troubled by a bad habit is to associate with people that have the opposite good habit. But what if we can't find such a person? <laughs> yeah. 
Well, then a really good way to get out of a rut is to fast. Surprising, huh? Master says, an abundance of fruits and vegetables in the daily diet, and each week, a one-day fast on fruit juices, with a longer fast occasionally, will greatly help to change the cerebral grooves that entrench the pernicious habits. I think, as we all know, fasting is having something of a cultural moment right now. Um, mostly for reasons of physical health, but even people that are in very competitive industries, they're turning to intermittent fasting as a way to sharpen their edge, because they, they know that fasting brings these wonderful states of mental clarity and creativity. Master has this talk on the physical, mental and spiritual benefits of fasting. So again, if we have something that's really you know, we, we just can't seem to shake. Again, within reason, not to become fanatics. And of course, if you're older and health conditions, check with your doctor. But a little fast. And Master's saying on fruit juices here, in, in this particular case, so it's not like it's, it's extreme. But that can shake things up. And can't you just feel how, like, you know, just the very thought of fasting kind of shakes thing, things up in your head? <laughs> You know, bringing back some of that anxiety and worry that, <laughs> that you've worked so hard to get rid of. Um, but, but there's been such a lot of, you know, again, fascinating research on this in the last few years, how, how it really helps in body and mind, and we know it has profound, profound spiritual effects as well. You know, this question asked about detachment at the beginning. It said, uh, could you please discuss detachment on the spiritual path? Well. Again, fasting, you know, we, we learn all about detachment when we go on a little fast. <laughs> but again, don't be extreme, moderation in everything. Next question, how can I overcome sleepiness in order to meditate early in the morning and after a full day of activities? So often I read in Guruji's teachings that we sleep too much, we should rather meditate, that the night is meant for communion with God. However, when I do this, I'm wiped out the next day and can't function properly in my work. Well, I think this is something many of us have done when we come on the, path, on the spiritual path. You know, we're so on fire to find God that sleep is just... <laughs> it's a waste of time. Um, so we try to cut down on sleep too much too soon. You know, after all, it does seem like Master is, is encouraging us to do so in his writings, or it can seem that way. But Master has to do that because he's trying to reach us through his words, you know, after he's left his physical body. But then we need to use our intuition and ask ourselves, well, what, what does what Master say here mean for me where I'm at in my, on my spiritual journey? And for those of us that are new on the path, and even for those of us that have been on the path for some time, the solution is pretty straightforward. And we've got a leaflet called Alertness in Meditation. It covers everything you'd want to know about dealing with drowsiness in meditation. But the very first point is this, and it's worth quoting. Get sufficient sleep. <laughs> That's what it says. One will notice over the years that as he learns to meditate deeply, his sleep requirement will slowly decrease. But one should not deliberately sleep less because he is meditating more, on the assumption that he doesn't need as much. The length of one's sleep will gradually decrease in a natural way, as the beneficial effects of deep meditation gradually manifest. Next question. When I'm participating in group meditations and prayer services, I often feel disconnected and distant from the group. Somehow I don't feel emotionally connected with the group. Is this common? How can I really feel part of it and benefit from the group effort? Well, I don't think it's uncommon that devotees don't feel emotionally connected with, with the group. But of course, that is more typical when we're new to a group. And I, but I wouldn't say it's common either. When I first started attending uh, one of the SRF groups, this was when I was living in London, I didn't wait around before or after the services and meditations to talk with other devotees. And 
the main reason was because living in London and living a long way from the, from the center, I just really didn't have the time to fit it into my schedule. But again, at the beginning of the path, I was just so enamored with the idea of meditation and the guru-disciple relationship, it, it just wasn't a priority for me. But over the months, over the weeks and months, as time went on, I naturally uh, grew those emotional bonds with the other devotees at the London Centre, and it, it became like family to me for, uh, for those four or five years I was living in London. Just a, so it's a wonderful thing to have these emotional bonds with fellow devotees. And again, you know, we feel it so strongly here at Convocation. But whether we feel those bonds or not, especially at the beginning, we always benefit from attending group meditations. Because the purpose of our groups, the primary purpose at least, is to provide an environment in which we can develop our personal relationship with God and Master and the Gurus. And we don't need an emotional connection with other devotees for that, but of course it is wonderful. But everything flows from the spiritual effort first. And then we'll find, over time, those emotional attachments, good attachments, come about. That said, of course, you know, attending the social events at a group, or especially serving at a group, these are wonderful ways to help develop those emotional bonds with our fellow devotees. Next question. In God Talks with Arjuna, Master explains that those who reach the final freedom from attachments absorb attachments and desires within. How can one be free of desires and attachments by absorbing them within? It would seem they would be strengthened rather than conquered. So the particular verse this uh, devotee is asking about is uh, chapter 2, verse 70, where Krishna says, the sage who is full with contentment, who absorbs all desires within, as the brimful ocean remains unmoved by water is entering into it, not he who lusts after desires. So Master explains here in his commentary that the meaning of absorb is transmute. I mean, you're quite right that we don't want to become some sort of desire sponge or, you know, like... Master has this phrase, matter-drenched. I, I, I just love that phrase, you know, the idea that we could be matter-drenched. So, absorbing means to transmute. And he, Master goes on to say that the paradox with this is that it doesn't mean we give up our good aspirations and desires. He actually says that good aspirations pursued wisely actually increase our peace actually increase our peace. So this is why balanced recklessness is not incompatible with increasing our peace, as long as they're good aspirations and desires. And Master says our peace actually gathers reinforcement by distribution, by going out into the world and serving. Brother Santosh Ananda gave a convocation talk once, this is about 20 years ago now, talk was in our magazine, and brought this devotee had a question, and brother answered it in such a wonderful way, it really speaks to, to what Krishna is trying to tell Arjuna in this verse. This devotee had come to brother and said, you know, brother, I, you know, I got all these responsibilities, I'm supervising hundreds of people, they're coming to me with all their problems, uh, you know, what do I do? I meditate in the morning and I feel peaceful, I feel great, but then I go into work and, you know, it's like everything hits me and what do I do? And the uh, brother said, nothing. And, you know, the devotee was <laughs> like, uh, nothing? And, and brother said, in fact, I suggest you do one less thing in your busy life. Stop losing your peace. Stop losing your peace. You don't have to add anything to your schedule. Just don't lose what you've cultivated within in the morning meditation. And this devotee called brother two months later, and it's worth quoting this in full. He said, brother, it works. When I concentrate on not letting go of my peace, I am kinder, I feel less pressure, I am more patient, I feel a greater attunement, I even feel deeper joy. I'm doing my duties better. 
I did not have to add another metaphysical practice to my life. I just had to retain the peace I feel within me. I feel like a total person now. I'm not divided anymore in conflict with myself. Wherever I go, I feel I'm in the right place. I mean, doesn't that sound like a, just a fabulous place to be? So now for the final question, which I really shouldn't answer, but uh, here it is. I just can't get it through my head why spirit, who is ever conscious, ever knew bliss, needed the entertainment of an imperfect, delusional creation. <laughs> When we melt back into God, we could not possibly want anything else or need other entertainment. What is he getting out of this? <laughs> he already had our perfect love and perfect bliss. Excuse my ignorance, but please help to get this point through my thick head. That's what's written here. <laughs> Jai Guru, please have mercy on us. <laughs> well, I mean, don't ask me. But that's the question, exactly as it was written. And uh, the wisest course here is to leave this question alone, because <laughs> Because in the last chapter of the autobiography, Master said, countless other men have posed such questions and philosophers have sought in vain fully to answer them. And Sri Keshwar had said, leave a few mysteries to explore in eternity. <laughs> and, and, you know, when, as counselors, we're told very clearly, if you don't know the answer to a question, don't try to answer it. <laughs> you know, say, I'll go and check and... Uh, I'll get back to you. <laughs> so why did God create the world? Well, here's what I think. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, it's, it's what Master thinks, but, but, but I think instead of asking, uh, <laughs> why, why did God do this? We, we try to put ourselves in God's shoes, as it were. I mean, what would you do if you had all that bliss and happiness? I mean, wouldn't you want to create something? I mean, this is where this spirit of creativity comes from. We're just so happy we want to do something. I mean, we all like to play and have fun, right? Right? And do we feel we need a reason to have fun? No. Same with God. I mean... I know, I should have left it alone. But... <laughs> But God, God has his happiness dial cranked all the way to the top, and, and he broke it off and threw it away. So, so, like, no matter what happens, he's not going to be affected by it. And, I mean, you know, if you try to put yourself in God's shoes, I mean, doesn't, I mean it doesn't seem that difficult to, to understand why he created the world. You know, but there's this thing Master says, that there is one thing uh, that he, he wants to see from this creation, that we have our free will and we can choose whether to give God our love or not. And that's, Master said, that's, that's really all he wants to see, how that plays out. So we, you know, even though God's happiness is all the way up, we can, you know, turn it a little bit higher by giving him our love. And so many of the questions today, you know, have come down to this. Do we think we're separate from God? When we think that we are, that's when the problems begin. But we never are. In that sense, liberation is just a thought away. One final consideration. Wouldn't you create a universe if you had the choice? And someday, when you're a causal being, you will. It's hard to believe. But Master said this in the autobiography. Those who find themselves covered only by the delicate veil of the causal body can bring universes into manifestation, even as the Creator. So that's something to look forward to. Uh, <clears throat> not just yet, you know, we've still got to shave in the morning and etc. So, so let's just end this satsang with this beautiful thought from the Upanishads in Master's translation, which really sums up for me the thread running through all the questions we have and, and the answers today. From joy we have come, in joy we live and have our being, and one day, in that sacred joy, we shall melt again. Jai Guru.